He has over 20 years experience researching housing justice, gentrification, and forced displacement. In 2017, he authored and published the interactive story map redlining Louisville, the history of race, class, and housing in Louisville, Kentucky, which received recognition from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government in its effort to recognize best-in-class data visualizations. Has anybody been able to read that book or see that? It is an amazing, an amazing publication. Uh, he is a pioneer in documenting and exposing how city planning was weaponized as a tool to deny black people land ownership and access to the accumulation of generational wealth. His work on the history of city planning, root cause analysis, and gentrification displacement makes him a featured speaker nationally. He is currently attending the Methodologies of Housing Justice Summer Institute at UCLA's Institute on Equality, uh, Inequality and Democracy. His maps, data analysis, and research have been featured in the work of the Cressage Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National League of Cities, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, City Lab, the Urban Equity Lab, as well as a host of local and national academic research, public policy, and planning organizations. Uh, we've been talking for a while. I've been trying to get him here for a while. He's so busy, but I'm so thankful that he's here today. Uh, I've been able to hear uh, his presentation. I know it's changed, uh, but when I heard his presentation, maybe a few uh, maybe a year or so uh, back, it completely changed the way that I saw uh, many of the things that are going on here in the city. So I want you to give him a round of applause. We are so thankful that he's here during the Answers Conference. Let's put our hands together for Mr. Joshua Poe. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you need to stand or anything? I'm good. good. Uh, well, good morning. Well, I just want to start off by thanking Pastor Finley and thanking the Kingdom Fellowship for having me. It's always an honor uh, to come out and give this presentation. Uh, so, but before we get into the presentation, I kind of like to talk about my personal background because one of the things that's happened lately is I give this presentation a lot, like all over the country, right? And, and when you talk about housing justice and social justice, particularly with... Um, you know, when racial justice, I get a lot of questions from white audiences. And I'm just I'm kind of bombarded with these questions all the time from white people asking me, you know, how did you become interested in this? That's like what everybody wants to know. And I think it's important to kind of frame my own personal experience with research and investigation because I think looking at it from the standpoint of interest is really a long way, the wrong way to frame it. Uh, because if we look at it from the standpoint of interest, it allows people to sort of dismiss the information as if we're well, just not interested in that, right? Like I'm interested in architecture or hockey or sports or something else. So it's more applicable or, or a better analogy would be to say, you know, there's a house on the street that's on fire and some people live far enough away that they don't feel the flames from the heat so that they can sort of ignore that fire. And I think talking about these issues in that framing makes a lot more sense than just saying, well, how did you become interested? As if I just woke up one day and said, hey, I'm interested in finding you know, historic maps that expose the legacy of white supremacy. You know, it doesn't happen like that. So my own personal experience with investigation comes from being directly impacted uh, by systems of oppression. And I grew up in, in, I grew up in Cincinnati uh, and also in Eastern Kentucky and in Appalachia. And my family was really poor. You know, my family in Cincinnati, my mom having, she was 15. You know, our median household income was under $10,000 a year. So if you grow up, you know, under $10,000 a year, that means you are barely, you know, clinging to housing. You're barely, you're barely pay, paying the bills, right? So I went to live with my grandparents in Eastern Kentucky and they made about 25,000 a year. And that was like going to stay with wealthy relatives, right? There's a big difference there. So we kind of just lump poor people all in the same boat. Like, you know, if you're just poor, you're poor and that's it. But it's not, there are a lot of nuances and complexity around these issues. So if you grow up poor in Appalachia and you get a political education, you pretty much know two things. One is the same entities that exploited and destroyed, destroyed your community have also crafted a narrative that blames the people in that community for the conditions in the community. So you just know that, right? 
And when I look back on my work, like my bio makes me sound really smart and all this, but really when you look back on my work, most of my work over the last 20 years has been about attacking that narrative, right? As a kid, I would see people like my grandparents be blamed for their own poverty, and I just knew that that wasn't true. And if you don't have a political education, you really don't have language to push back on that and to challenge that. So what happens is if you don't have a political education, you kind of internalize that trauma. And when we internalize trauma, we know there are all sorts of horrible outcomes that come from that addiction, uh, uh, abuse. I mean, bad things happen when trauma is internalized. So it's so important. And one of the things I work on is trying to make sure that people who are directly impacted receive political education so they can then engage in political organizing and political work. So um, my journey to this work um, kind of comes from doing, started out doing economic justice work, labor organizing, and really doing anti-capitalist work. And I was, I was really involved with, with you know, a lot of anti-capitalist work that was going on. And um, there again, I sort of apprenticed under some very radical people in the country. And it was kind of broken down to me, like we can't really deal, we can't do anti-capitalist work unless we do anti-racist work first and really understanding the connections between those two things. So um, I moved back to Cincinnati in, in around 2003, and that's when the riots happened there, and, 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 and that happened in the neighborhood I was living in. And I really saw the riots as a housing issue, and I was really interested in, in a sort of exploring the way the police interact in gentrification efforts and how uh, the private sector interacts with the police in those efforts. So I started really investigating city planning, architecture, maps, data visualization. And, and around this time, I was sort of getting too old to be an organizer. I was like the oldest guy in our little office, and I was telling people how it used to be. You know, and, and if you ever find yourself doing that, it's time to move on and go somewhere else. So I went to college, I went to Berea College, and I wound up here in Louisville in the School of Urban and Public Affairs. And I, and, and I was bringing a social justice perspective into the field of city planning, which was a very unwelcome perspective at that time. It still is, as a matter of fact. So I'm in the School of Public Affairs, and I'm, and, and I'm always, I'm always, uh, I've always been interested in the history of place and explaining place, how place has got to be the way they are. So I'm investigating Louisville, and I'm really discovering a lot of things about the history of city planning that I really didn't find in a textbook, that I really didn't find in, in any curriculum. And this information is, is, is very unwelcome by the faculty at, U, at, at the University of Louisville at the time. Keep in mind, at that time, there were no black professors in the School of Urban and Public Affairs. Today, I think there's one, but he's getting ready to leave, so it's, it's going to be the same again. But, so, and, and they're teaching that segregation was the result of individual choice in the housing market, which I found to be embarrassing. And I found that to be unacceptable for a graduate school to be teaching that in 2009. And coming from where I came from, I was very, you know, I'm very, vo I have a very challenging conflict oriented personality. So I was very vocal about why that was unacceptable and embarrassing. And so I'm just sort of engaged in conflict every day with the staff at the school I'm in. And I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this where you're doing work that you feel really strongly about, but there's a whole group of people more educated than you, more powerful than you, telling you you're wrong, you kind of start to question yourself. You kind of start to question, is this even worth it? Is it even worth it to keep engaging in this conflict? Is it even worth it to stay on this path? Am I really right about this? And around that time, um, uh, I was sort of feeling worn down. You can get really worn down spiritually when you're engaged in conflict every day. Uh, and around that time, my work uh, got noticed by Dr. Blaine Hudson, who was a big hero of mine, who was the Dean of Arts and Sciences at UofL, sent me an email out of the blue one day and said, hey, I'm really interested in this work that you're doing. And that was, that was all I needed. Because uh, I'd kind of gone to hear Dr. Hudson lecture, and I just kind of sat at his feet for a number of, you know, for months listening to him. And, and, and once I got that email from him, I was off. He invited me to present at the Saturday Academy. Uh, we started talking. He kind of mentored me in a lot of ways. And, and he said, you know, you really need to find Louisville's redlining maps. They would kind of tie your research together, and they would give some legitimacy to the things you're talking about, and they just need to be discovered and published. At that time, I thought that was as simple as going to the library or the Filson or the city or UofL and just pulling these maps out. And that wasn't the case at all. These maps were buried. They were classified. We couldn't find them. Dr. Hudson had never found them. So this was in 2011. Didn't find the maps until 2013 in the Cartographic Archives in Washington, D.C. 
And the sad part about the story is the real tragic part is that Dr. Hudson passed away, I think, three months before I actually found the map. So he never actually got to see the work that he was really the catalyst for. But, you know, I dedicate the project to him. The work really stands on his shoulders. And in presenting this work, um, I, 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 I knew when I discovered the maps that there was a real danger in presenting this as history. So I really try to push back on the notion that anything about this is historic or past. Everything, people ask me all the time, does redlining still happen? And I say, yes, we just call it the real estate market. So if you go, if you get an issue of Louisville Business First newspaper and open it up, what you find there is redlining. You know, there's glaring examples of the language has changed, but the process and the outcomes are exactly the same. I ended up taking some funding from the city to finish my work, and we kind of diverged around that topic because I think the city really wanted to present, present this as a historic um, thing that we were now past or somehow weren't doing anymore. Uh, so, and I think in doing that, the city really did a disservice to the information. So. We've done a great job in Louisville of exposing redlining, but we've done a terrible job in explaining redlining. Uh, so when the city talks about redlining, they're really talking about just the loans, right? Like, basically they have crafted this narrative, like black people have been denied investment, so if we make investment, everything's gonna be all right, right? Like, that's gonna work out, without really contextualizing the, the, the complexity around racism and investment and racism and capitalism. So when I talk about redlining, I'm not really talking about the, uh, just the, the lending practices from the 30s. It's really more of an anchor term that I use to describe a series of policies throughout the, the, the 20th century. And, I, and I, by that, I mean zoning, uh, the FHA loans, urban renewal, and the Interstate Highway Act. And it's really these four policy areas that kind of shaped our cities and really made black people sort of a permanent underclass and kept black people trapped in poverty for generation after generation. Um, so, and, what you, and, and you really have to connect those policies to Reconstruction and slavery, right? Like, you, there's, they're so intertwined, you can't really separate them. So what you have around this time, black people are fleeing, you know, so the Civil War ends and, you know, the, the Union Army leaves and then, you know, black people are just sort of left at the mercy of the KKK and they, they experience white terrorism all over the South. You know, mass murder, the most barbaric acts on earth at that time are occurring in the southern United States against black people. So black people leave the South in mass, right? You know, between, 19, between 1890 and 1920, 1.5 million black people leave the South and they start moving to northern cities. And around this time, the profession of city planning is kind of getting itself together and being created. And in the early profession of city planning at the early conferences, there were really two groups that were represented. One group was really concerned about social issues public health issues, sanitation, overcrowding in tenements, uh, air pollution, and that was one side of the, of, of the faction at the planning conference. The other side was represented by people like Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., and they were concerned with what they called the rational organization of the city, or the scientific management of the city. And they were firmly rooted in the eugenics movement. They were social Darwinists. They believed that certain people were biologically unfit, and I don't know if they believe that, but that's what they said, and that they needed to be sort, sort of separated and sorted out in society. So these two factions converged and sort of clashed at the early planning conference, so that in 1910, the conference is called City Planning and the Problems of Congestion. By 1911, it's just called City Planning. Problems of congestion is dropped from the conference. So any concern about social issues, any concern about poor people was, were, was just disregarded by the profession. And that's still true today. Up until today, that's still the case. And around this time, as planning's being organized, we had what was called racial zoning. So cities were zoned by race. Right, and, 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 and all that meant was like you had black blocks and you had white blocks. A white person couldn't buy a house on a black block and vice versa. Louisville's racial zoning ordinance started in 1914 and it was sort of the envy of the rest of the country. Like St. Louis is talking about it, Atlanta's talking about it. And um, what happened was the NAACP formed in 1909. They come to Louisville and they meet a, a man named William Worley who was a, who was a, a, a graduate of Simmons University a black man and a real radical guy for his time. Like, Worley was super radical. You know, he, he owned a printing press. His printing press was burned to the ground about five times. He would start it back up and keep, 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 keep moving. And he came up with this idea that they would challenge the segregation ordinance. He had a, a white friend 
named Charles Buchanan, and they sort of orchestrated this setup where Worley would try to buy Buchanan's house, and when he couldn't buy the house, they would take it to the U.S. Supreme Court and overturn the ordinance, and it worked. In, the, in 1917, the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled against, US, against racial segregation. It was the NAACP's first victory, right? And they didn't, they didn't rule against the ordinance on any grounds of like racial justice or anti-segregation. They ruled against the ordinance because a white man couldn't profit from the sale of his property, so they abolished racial zoning. So at that point, racial zoning is over. You can't do it. It's against the law to, to zone cities racially. And what this did, it created sort of an avenue for city planners to legitimize their profession. And you see this in capitalism when laws are passed and, and regulations passed that brings about some sort of reform effort or social justice effort, immediately there's a loophole created, you know, like, like, you know, like uh, convict leasing replaced slavery and so on and so forth. So what happened was city planners sort of went back to the drawing board and tried to come up with a similar system that would be legal. So in 1921, they convened the, Her the Hoover Advisory Commission on Zoning, that Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce, and they come back with their findings in 1924 in the Hoover Commission on Zoning's report, they stated that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing any race whose presence would be a detriment to property values. So what that means is, let's just think for a minute about what that actually means. What that means is at the federal level, it's codified by the federal government that black people would be a threat to property values. That means a threat to wealth creation, right? So when you, and, it, and, that, and, that, and there's so many levels to what that actually means, but to just to let that sink in, you know, that means that, that for black people in this country since 1924, the human geography that, that black people occupy, the physical space they occupy, is not only a threat to their own ability to create wealth, but it's a threat to anyone in proximity to them, right? So, so where capital moves, black people have to move away from capital. Black people have no access to capital because their very presence destroys capital. And this is a federal policy, right? And you're not gonna find this in an, e in an economics class, you're gonna find it everywhere you look in this country. You know, you're talking about an entire economy saturated with racism, an entire economy really sort of built foundationally on racism. So, the Supreme Court upheld this zoning in 1926, and then zoning comes to Louisville in 1931, and, and really the architect of this policy is a guy named Harlan Bartholomew. A lot of my work really deals with Bartholomew, and if we think of like the, the worst ideas from the last 100 years in cities, Bartholomew was probably behind them. So he had a lot to do with single-use zoning. He had a lot to do with interstate highways in cities. He was the architect of all the fed major fed federal policies, the 1937 Housing Act, the 49 Housing Act that used eminent domain to take people's land, the 1956 Interstate Highway Act. He was behind all these, these things, right? So he came up with the idea of one-way streets. He came up with the idea of high-rise public housing. He came up with the idea of slum clearance. So he comes to Louisville in 1931, He's the country's first full-time city planner, and he's the first city planning professor. So he's not only doing this work himself, he's training other people to go do it. He introduced zoning in 1919 in St. Louis, and he said the purpose of zoning was really to prevent black people from moving into nice residential areas. So this is the person that created zoning, telling us very explicitly what the purpose of it was. He really used uh, methods from colonizers. He would study colonial town planning in, in, in Africa and South Africa and South America, and he would, he, would, he would use those methods in U.S. cities. He was very open about that. He was very proud of it. He said, that's really the methods we should use. One of the more insidious things he would do is try to predict where black people would move in cities, and he would zone those areas industrial. So if we think about the public health outcomes that we get today, if we think about you know, the statistics around black children have four having four times the rate of asthma as white children, those things were very much planned. They were designed, they were purposeful. None of that is happenstance. It was, it, was very, it was very intentional. So he comes to Louisville in 1931, and the city leaders ask him to go into Russell <clears throat> and deal with what they called the Negro housing problem in Russell. So when he gets to Russell, this is what he finds. This is, uh, this is Muhammad Ali today, this is 12th, this is 13th. And this here you find like sort of the heart of the black business district at the time, right? Like, like that's where people were opening up businesses. And you, every city sort of had a black business district like this. Now, if you study urban design today, 
what existed here is exactly what every city planner and urban designer tells you we need to build in cities, right? These are places where people can have economic freedom, you have great public health outcomes here, you have a mixture of building types, you have places, you know, when you hear about mixed use uh, environments, this was a mixed use environment, this was a mixed income neighborhood. Everything that we're trying to bring back now on Beecher Terrace existed here. So Bartholomew comes and sees this, and keep in mind, there are really only two times in our country's history when black people were gaining wealth. Immediately after the Civil War, when, 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 when people got some land, there was a small uptick in black wealth creation. And during this time, there was a slight uptick in black wealth creation because black people were opening banks, they were opening businesses, so there's a small uptick there. And we know that in the South, that lynching was a response to that wealth creation. And urban renewal was really a response to this wealth creation. So Bartholomew goes in, and he does this in every city in the country, goes into the black business district, sees this happening, and recommends that it just be demolished. Like recommend you just destroy the neighborhood. And you replace it with this building design, which is a single use apartment building layout, right? So you destroy all the businesses, you destroy all economic opportunity, you destroy the, the sort of social fabric of the neighborhood, and then you replace it with a design that is very reminiscent of sort of a prison or an institutional setting. So you're now talking about quarantining people, right? You're talking about isolating people. There's no economic activity here, right? There's no green space. There's no places for people to walk. There's nothing. It is a solid institutional block that looks like a prison design. <clears throat> and he does this all over the country. His reasons for this when he comes back to city leaders, he says, he, he, and he gives this as an explanation, he says there are a number of obstacles that are fundamental to any scheme for improving housing conditions among Negroes. He said a lack of desire among a large portion of the population for something better than they are accustomed to, right? He said if it were possible to create among the Negro masses a real desire for decent accommodations, the slums would automatically eliminate themselves. So we start to get that sort of social, Darwin, social Darwinism language, the, 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 the racist language of blaming people for their own conditions, the cultural explanations behind poverty and why people are poor. We don't look at it as a systemic issue. It's, it's you know, if people wanted better housing, they would have better housing, right? So, so, so we get this sort of language coming out of this era. And, um, and when, so when, I'm in, when I was in grad school, I would talk about people like Bartholomew and I would say, you know, our entire planning profession is rooted in, is rooted in white supremacist ideology. The foundational structure of the profession is rooted in white, white supremacy. My professors would get very upset, but this is, this is the type of stuff I was talking about. This was, were these quotes, uh, because Bartholomew wasn't some right-wing fringe element in society. He was very much, he was seen as a liberal in his time. He was seen as sort of a liberal, progressive reformer. Uh, and if we think about the man that made that quote, it's important to attach the quote to his influence and his reach. Because these are the number of cities Bartholomew worked in. He just, in just making comprehensive plans and zoning ordinances for. Now keep in mind, this is only 1920 to 1948. He lived till the 80s. He outlived like five wives, right? So he lived a long time. And he continued to work far past this, so his influence can't be understated, right? So the same mentality behind that quote shaped our, not just our policies, but shaped the physical design of our cities. So when we travel through cities today, when you go to Birmingham, when you go to Milwaukee, when you go to St. Louis, when you go to Louisville, Dayton, Ohio, it doesn't matter. The urban design that you experience there, the four lane highways that separate black neighborhoods from white neighborhoods, these things were designed and rooted in this sort of ideolo ideological planning. So that brings us up to, to redlining in 1938. So while all this is happening, people like Bartholomew, Herbert Hoover, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. were really planting the seeds for redlining far before it happened. We tend to think of redlining as sort of a New Deal policy, but it really was, the, it was really designed in the late, in, in like 1919 to 1924. And what redlining did was it sort of hijacked the development patterns that were happening. So if you look at Louisville's maps, you know, the, the highest graded areas were in the northeast. The green and blue areas were the high, received the highest grade, right? But Louisville was really developing in a south central direction at this time. You know, people wanted to live around the parks. People wanted to live around Cherokee Park, Shawnee Park, and Iroquois Park. Cherokee and Shawnee were already built up. You couldn't really get houses around those two parks. So people, Louisville was moving toward Iroquois. And if redlining hadn't happened, 
you know, the, the wealthiest neighborhoods in Louisville would be around, you know, in the south central area. So they sort of hijacked that development pattern and it pulled everything to the northeast. And I think it's important in looking at these maps, so, so when redlining occurred, it was done by the federal government, but it was done on behalf of banks and, private, and the private sector. We tend to think of power in this country as being you know, the, the government and then the private sector somehow below that, and that's very much not the case. The government, most of the time, even local government and federal government, the, most of the time the government is acting sort of as the client to the private sector. And that's what redlining was. The federal government came in and graded neighborhoods and made policies around it, and then they gave that information to the private sector to make decisions. So it was done for them, right? And so the government would come into every city, the 250 largest cities, and they would work with local consultants on these maps. And I think it's important that we put the names of the local consultants up, not to shame them or shame their families, but just try to understand that there is a debt that is owed in this process. And we'll also try to understand just how close this history is to us because a lot of the consultants that worked on this, their families today are still heavily involved in real estate and finance. They profited from this, they gained wealth from this, and that wealth was unearned, right? It's the system hijacked whatever we think of as the free market at that time. So in explaining redlining and explaining the purpose of redlining, they talk about the maps were made to graphically reflect the trend of desirability in neighborhoods. We're talking about deciding what things are worth, right? Placing a value on land. And in placing that value, they said that they use these factors, you know, the sale and demand, uh, percentage of home ownership, all the things that we would think of that you would use to grade property, uh, social status of the population. But at the last sentence, they say the price level of the homes is not the guiding factor. And how many people have taken an economics class? Doesn't matter where you go in this country, you can talk to old people, young people, doesn't matter, everyone most of the time has taken an economics class. They make sure we take that because they sort of indoctrinate us into believing that, 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 you know, the, uh, that the free market sort of guides how money is allocated and this and that. And it's sort of this just fanatical belief because they're saying that the price level of the homes are not the guiding factor and basically determine the price level of the homes, right? So, so we're gonna value property, but we're not valuing it on what it's actually worth. So if the price level of the home is not the guiding factor, what's the guiding factor? And if we look at the first grade areas, it talks about them being homogenous. And all of, I've reviewed most of the 250 maps and documents around redlining, and every document says the same thing. Homogenous areas receive the highest grade. And in that, the consultants would talk about how mixed neighborhoods, meaning diverse neighborhoods, would create unstable markets, right? And you see that over and over again throughout these documents. So, so hold on to that, I'm gonna to get to that at the end. So the neighborhood that received the highest ranking in Louisville is the Mockingbird Valley, Indian Hills neighborhoods, the A1 neighborhood. So the consultants are basically saying, this is the best place to lend money, this is the best place to live. Keep in mind, this is not where people really wanted to live at this time people wanted to live around those parks. So the richest people in Louisville were living around Cherokee Park and Shawnee Park. That's where you found the highest home values. This area wasn't even fully developed. So you see the hash marks. That means there's nothing there, it's just empty land. It received the highest ranking because the consultants say it is the highest restricted residential area in the city. And by restricted, they mean deed restrictions. And by deed restrictions, they mean legal documents placed on homes that prohibited them from being sold to black people. Right, so once you tie property values to race, you've now set in motion this system where white wealth is directly contingent upon black exclusion. So if you're a white person and you bought a house here, say in 1935, you're not super wealthy, right? But by 1945, your house is worth an astronomical amount and you didn't do anything to earn that except you bought a house in an area where a black person wasn't allowed to live, right? And so you're wealthy. You sell that house, you buy three more houses. That is unearned wealth. That's unearned privilege based solely on racism, right? In our entire city, you, you can't really, you know, I, I study this and, the imp I, and every day I'm seeing new implications of it. Like it's kind of sinking in of just how, how massive the system is. So in looking at the, at the so, so what ended up happening, back up a second, on the flip side of that is, if you're a white person who's relatively wealthy and you live in, Shawnee, in the Shawnee neighborhood, by 1945, by 1955, your property value hasn't increased. Right? And you're like, what happened? Your property value hasn't increased because black people live close to you, and that's the only reason. So what do you do? 
you move, right? And you move farther east. And this is really what created the suburbs. This is what created that entire process. So our spatial sort of economy is predicated upon that sort of that, that expansion. Um, and, I'll, and, and, I, and so now you can kind of see we're kind of moving, we're kind of reversing that process. I'll get into that a little bit later. So in the maps, the consultants lift different, fact, different factors, you know, types of inhabitants, occupation. The occupation for Indian Hills were, were businessmen and capitalists. So being a capitalist was an occupation in Indian Hills in 1938. I don't know what that means. But the second grade areas, I'm just going to kind of give an example of the role race played in, 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 in making these evaluations. So the second grade area, a good example is a B6 area. This is Bardstown Road. This is the uh, sort of Bonnie Castle, Douglas Hills neighborhood, right? This is Trevilian. It's up there where like late side swimming pool in that area is, and up, up by Bellarmine. So Bellarmine would be like right here. Um, you know, good neighborhood, you know, good schools, what they say, Bardstown Road. But in the bottom, in the, in the clarifying remarks, and this is how important race was to the consultants and to the banks, they talk about at, the, at Harvard and Dundee streets, there are 10 black families and they say they're closely grouped and no probability of any further increase in Negro infiltration. And they say stuff like that over and over again all over the country. They had to let the banks know if black people lived in the neighborhood and or whether there was a probability that black people might live in the neighborhood. And you just see that in every city and it became so systemic. So. Homogenous areas received the highest grades if they thought that an area, if they, were, if they thought there was a possibility for black people, white people, or immigrant groups to live in the same neighborhood, they graded those areas very low. So Chickasaw got a low grade. Phoenix Hill, Butchertown, Clifton Heights got a low grade. Park Hill, Algonquin got a low grade. They said the balance was bad, right? Portland and Russell got a low grade. Mixture of population, no restrictions. So in the explanation, the consultants say, and they say this in every every uh, city. They said, in using these maps, we don't mean to imply that good mortgages do not exist or cannot be made in the CND areas, but we do think they should be made and serviced on a different basis. And what that means is that's, that means the creation of two economies, right? That's, you're talking about creating two economies and one group of people has no access to the other economy. You're basically, basically creating a caste system by doing that. You're creating a caste system where one group of people has no access to the capital that exists in the other system. And by caste system, I mean permanent caste system. Right? It's caste because people can't get out of it. Right? You can't get out of that situation. You can marry out of it. You can marry somebody with wealth. But it's really impossible after this for black people to create wealth for themselves. And I was talking to somebody in Atlanta recently about the idea of, you know, can, can we close the racial wealth gap through entrepreneurship? And, you know, I threw out the data that, you know, if we think about black entrepreneurship, the, the, the Walmart family, Walmart has more business revenue than all the black businesses in the country combined. And when you really dig into the data around wealth, you see that this system really just prevented black people from gaining any wealth. So if we look at, a, if we look at, um, incomes, if we look at segregation in Louisville, you see how this system impacts all those areas. So I made a map for Louisville that really showed sort of how Louisville is hyper segregated. And the blue areas are, are areas that are 80% white and the red areas are, are, eight, are over 80% black. And Louisville is segregated so differently than the rest of the country. So the Census Bureau gives us 25 ways to measure segregation and none of them really apply here. So typically when you study cities and look at cities, even cities that are really segregated, there are multiple poor areas, right? You've got all kinds of, you've got several poor, poor neighborhoods around the city, you've got several black neighborhoods around the city. Louisville sort of pushed all the black people into the West End and kind of sealed it off and this was very intentional. They talked about doing that in the Courier Journal as early as 1888. Um, so what you have in Louisville is, is, is over 75% over of the black population in Jefferson County lives on less than 5% of the land. And I can't find any city with anything like that. And what that means is that as the West End becomes gentrified, there are fewer places for people to go and less area for people to absorb the people that are being displaced and pushed out. And, and what, what ends up happening with situations like this is that these blue areas, those are all white spaces. And I'm not, when I first moved to Louisville, it was kind of shocking of just how often I found myself in all white spaces. You know, if you go to Seneca Park, it's kind of an all white space. If you go to, you know, when we were looking at daycare for my daughter, like they were all white spaces. And when you have all white spaces, that's what enables a society to just become saturated with racism, right? Because if, if white people had stayed in Shawnee Park, 
they would have grew up, you know, their kids would have grown up with black people. They would have known people. They would have seen people. And in seeing people, you come to acknowledge people. And in acknowledging people, you acknowledge, like, racialized barriers. But if you don't see people, you don't really uh, believe that racialized barriers exist. And then the only information that you have about people is what's being sold to you, right, when you turn on Wave 3 News or when you turn on BET or when you turn on MTV or any sort of corporate product that has a, an, an investment in perpetuating racist stereotypes. And I think Louisville is really sort of on the far end of that because we are so hyper-segregated. So people spend their whole lives in these all-white spaces. You know, they go to JCPS, and I found out JCPS is sort of internally segregated in the schools. So there are all sort of mechanisms that work here. And then if we look at incomes, <clears throat> we find that, you know, that Mockingbird Valley, Indian Hills area, no surprise, has the highest median household incomes in the city. That's where you find incomes of like 500K. You know, people that make over 600K, 500K, that's where, they're, that's where they lived, right? Because of the wealth that was created there in, in the 30s. And then if you look around downtown, we don't really contextualize poverty in Louisville, but we've got some of the poorest areas in the country around downtown. Median household income, west of 9th Street, where Beecher Terrace is, is 9,500 a year. Median household income in the California neighborhood is 12, is about 13,000 a year, right? If you go to Appalachia, we think of Appalachia as like the poorest area of the country, median household incomes there are about 23K. So we could double the median incomes in a lot of black neighborhoods in this country, like East St. Louis, like Gary, Indiana, like Birmingham, like Dayton, Ohio, and not reach Appalachian poverty, right? So we've got a situation where people are just barely paying bills and has ha, and, and people and so when you increase rent by thirty dollars a month in an area where the median income is under 15k that's really hard when you increase it by three hundred dollars a month people are homeless and that's what we're seeing all over the country as gentrification comes in so there's really no wealth among this group of people the group of people that were impacted by slavery that were impacted by reconstruction that were impacted by redlining are sort of a wealthless group Black people make up 14% of the population in this country. They have 2%, 2.6% of the wealth. But of that 2.6%, that's highly concentrated. So really just a few people have that, right? It's not really spread out. And you don't really find that past the boomer generation. So, you know, we like to, you know, we sort of like dangle like Jay-Z and people out and say he's a billionaire, but that he has nothing compared to like white wealth, right? And, and, and we sort of celebrate like, you know, someone getting, getting rich, but we're really talking about like a wealthless group of people. Um, so, Bartholomew came back to Louisville in the, in the 50s, and he did this all over the country. And, and by, by the 50s, you have, you know, two housing acts, you have the Interstate Highway Act, and that's, this is where you get urban renewal and the Interstate Highway. So he comes back to Louisville. Most of the black people in Louisville lived in these two areas around downtown. They were very dense. And he recommends just destroying these two areas, and this happened everywhere. You know, we would destroy one area, we would build our hospitals there. So if you look at New Orleans hospitals, Cincinnati's hospital, Chicago, those were black neighborhoods at one time that were physically, you know, destroyed. And then we would build the hospitals in their place. Uh, and what was happening at this time is we were building a lot of public housing. And public housing was, was really built for, you know, the housing shortage and people coming back from World War II, and it was segregated. So federal law mandated that if, if public housing was built, one group would be built for, one site would be built for white people, one site would be built for black people, and that's how it happened. But three years later, the public housing for white people is empty, like they all left. It's completely vacant. There's like not one white person left in any of those sites all over the country. And the reason they left is because they were accessing FHA loans in the suburbs, right? But those FHA loans, by law, had to be deed restricted. So black people couldn't buy a house, in a, they couldn't buy those houses in the suburbs by, by federal law. It's not a private decision, and that's an important distinction. If it's a private distinction, the federal government do, doesn't owe a debt to those people, right? If this is a, a decision happens in the private market, well, there's nothing we can do about it. But this was federal policy, which means a debt is owed. So what happens to the public housing that, that, that's now vacant? Black people move into that, right? And it's not as if white people just went to the suburbs, all the jobs went to the suburbs, all the infrastructure went to the suburbs, all the investment went to the suburbs. This is why the civil rights movement targeted public transportation in their initial campaign because that was the only access they had to get to those jobs. And this is really where you get the kind of destruction of the cities with interstate highways coming in, with single-use zoning, with surface parking lots. You know, when we look around like sort of west, 
this area today, this area of west of downtown, we see, you know, there are no trees there and there's no housing there, and we just kind of destroyed our cities. Um, and, and it's important to understand, like, the intentionality behind that destruction. So that sort of brings us up to today, right? And if we think about, you know, the, so, so my thesis is sort of city planning was designed to segregate the United States, and its purpose today is really to gentrify the United States. So cities have been sprawling and sprawling and sprawling, and we've sort of moved through three economies in this country, right? We moved through uh, three, three, three versions of an economic system. And my point is that black communities and black people were really, and the exploitation of those communities were really the drivers of wealth in all three of those economies. So we started out with an agrarian economy, right? And, and, and so wealth was created through, you know, the capture of African slaves and, and, and the free labor of, of slavery. And we moved to an industrial economy. You know, wealth creation in that economy was, was contingent upon exploitation through low wages. And now we're moving to a real estate-based economy, right? So, the, so, it, so as, as development moves back into the urban core, fortunes are really being made through the, the exploitation of black people depressing property values, and then as it becomes white owned, it's suddenly worth a massive amount of money, right? So that's what's happening. And we're really doing that by sort of incentivizing whiteness. So when I talk to city planning students today, and they ask me, you know, how do, how do I become successful? I tell them, study graphic design, because all you're gonna be doing for the next 20 years is cropping images onto black neighborhoods of white people pushing baby carriages, drinking coffee, riding bicycles, or walking dogs. And when I look at plans all over the country, I mean, it's funny, but I've got a slide that shows about 200 images from Atlanta to Chicago to New York to DC, and that's all they've done. Take a black neighborhood, get a white person on a bicycle, and that's your plan, that's your city plan, right? And you make, they make, you know, 60, 80,000 a year doing this. Uh, uh, I left the profession six years ago and haven't looked back since. I'm now engaged in really trying to dismantle the profession from the outside and, and rebuild it as something more equitable. But that's what's happening. So when we think about Russell today, as I started to investigate what's happening in Russell, I kind of had to go back to merger, right? Merger was 2003 when Louisville City and County Government merged. And if you look at what was happening around that time, the Brookings Institute is a major federal think tank. They fly into town, they get paid about $300,000 to fly into town, have dinner with the mayor, tell him exactly what, what he wants to hear, fly out, and that's what they do. So they come to town and they tell the city leaders at that time, you know, you, you're like ranked number two in the country as having some of the most concentrated poverty around your downtown, like it's off the charts. Like you guys in New Orleans, are like, it's, it looks bad, right? And that needs to change, but we don't have any idea how to change that. So if you merge your city and county government, it will dilute that data and it'll just look a lot better for businesses that want to locate here. And we know this because the mayor at the time talked about it. After merger, he said Louisville was becoming older, blacker, and poorer, right? And that's what they meant. So when they try to attract Amazon, when they try to attract Google, when they try to attract Microsoft, the data looks really bad. And merger improved that data. So now fast forward to say 2012 or 13. You know, the, the, there's a new mayor in office. Um, the market crashed in 2008, and it's now we now we have this desire to sort of move back to the you know move back to the urban core. And what happened in Louisville is that uh, um, a lot of cities in 2008, when the market crashed, kind of got ahead on this. So they started investing in downtown very early. Nashville invested in downtown. Since excuse me, Cincinnati invested in downtown. Louisville doesn't. They invest in a bridges project that's now sort of a national embarrassment and it's sort of a sprawl machine. So the Brookings Institute comes back to town and they say, look, you've got this bridges project, you're investing in this massive park way out in the east end, and that's really not what people want to see. People want to live downtown, but you guys are, have made no investments in downtown. You've built no housing downtown. So now you have to bring, we have to bring you up very rapidly in order to be competitive with Nashville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis. And if you listen to the language from the city right now and from the developers, they use the same language. They're always talking about the competitiveness of a city, right? We've got to be competitive. And we're just sort of doing anything to try to lure investors and businesses to the city. So what they say is that the competitiveness of a city means an intentional focus around lifting census tracts out of poverty. And I think when people hear that, they think that they mean there's some program or there's some initiative to help the people in those census tracts escape poverty. And that's not what it means at all. 
It means lifting the census tract out of poverty, right? To change that data. Because if, if we're trying to get Microsoft to invest, if we're trying to get Amazon to invest, they don't want to see a census tract next to downtown where the median income is $9,000 a year, right? They know what that means. They want to see white people living next to downtown. They want to see things that, that, that white people like, businesses that they like next to downtown, right? So people have to be pushed out. So in, in five years in Russell, what we'll get is, is we'll get presentations where the city says, we've increased college degree attainment in this area, or we've doubled the median income in this area. It doesn't mean anybody in that area got a college degree who lived there before. It means they were moved somewhere else. And we're, they're calling this sort of spatial deconcentration, right? And this is really the next chapter in redlining. It's sort of how redlining kind of moved back spatially because that separate economy that was created has been separate from the urban core for so long. Now that economy is moving back to the urban core. And since black people can't participate in that economy, they have to be pushed out. And it's not about space and it's not about availability, it's simply about price. So right now in Louisville, we have a housing crisis. We're 31,000 units short at the lowest income levels. So we're not building any housing for people that make under 25,000 a year. As a matter of fact, we're decreasing the number of units. We've got an eviction rate that's double the national average. 14 people are evicted here every day, mostly people in the, in the West End. <clears throat> Some days it's as high as 50, right? It's a devastating problem. We're, we, we're ju we're, and we're demolishing 800 units in Beecher Terrace. We're replacing those with 670 units. So when the city says, or the housing authority says that we're doing one-for-one -one replacement, they don't mean on-site replacement. That means if you had a unit in Beecher Terrace, you are guaranteed to get a, a scattered site public housing or a Section 8 voucher somewhere in Jefferson County, right? And you go to the top of the list. Now we've already got a waiting list for Section 8 that's about 25,000 people long. So now they get pushed farther down. So the narratives around this are not very accurate, right? But I think we hear this and a lot of people think, oh, well, we destroy Beecher Terrace, we're going to build new housing, and people are going to be able to come back. No. That's not what's happening. And as soon as you challenge the housing authority or the city on any of these issues, it just kind of unravels and falls apart. So this, this is a bad situation. You know, the eviction rate and, and what we've had are programs like Hope Six, programs like Choice Neighborhoods where we're trying to deconcentrate poverty and black people are basically being disappeared in the suburbs, right? We're, we're moving people out of the urban core in Milwaukee, in Detroit, in Chicago, and people are having to live far, far outside the city. So Chicago and Detroit have lost black population. It was unthinkable that Chicago and Detroit would lose black population 10 years ago, right? I would, if somebody hit me with that statistic, I would never thought that would be possible. So in my own investigation around this, it's a lot worse than I ever imagined it being. Um, so one of the things that's happening in Louisville is we're, just as an example, we're using affordable housing trust fund money, but we're not building affordable housing with that money. And one of the reasons is it's all based on income limits. So we use something called area median income, and I'm going to get into a little bit of data. Just stay with me. Area median income in Louisville is $71,000 a year. That number means nothing, right? It's just sort of a made-up number. It basically means that's what developers wish people made, right? If I'm a landlord, I really wish you made $500 more than you actually made so I could charge you more for rent. So actual median income is 50000 We use the multiplier to get this number, right? And it's sort, of a, it's sort of a holdover or sort of like residue from, from the 30s. So what happened with redlining is that we created, all, we created this sort of racist system and then it's perpetuated. So today when we use measures that appear to be objective on the surface, they're not really objective, right? So if we're building housing at 80% area median income, that's $57,000 a year. When we need housing at $21,000 a year. The problem is that very few black households in Louisville make $57,000 a year. You know, if you're making $57,000 a year in Louisville, Kentucky, that's middle class. I'd say it's maybe even like higher middle class, right? Like you're doing all right. If you make, I'd say if you make around $60,000, you're not really struggling, you know, unless you have, unless you have a house you can't afford. So like I said, we don't really contextualize income and poverty here very well. And if you look at West Louisville, we only have two census tracts where people make over 30K. And that's in, that's in like Shawnee and Chickasaw, right? So if you look at, say, between, between 264 and 9th Street, most of the median household incomes are under 20K. So think about what's going to happen as, we, as rent starts to increase in those areas, right? So here's what we're actually building. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund just this year made a $1 million loan to the Portland, to the Urban Acupuncture 
and HPI as part of the Portland Invest Investment Initiative. It's Gil Holland's land. So we loan Gil Holland a million dollars. We tell him he can pay back 900K, right, which he doesn't need, and we're, to build 24 units. So that's about $42,000 a unit. You could almost rehab a, a house for that much. And it's at 80% area median income. A one bedroom apartment at 80% area median income rents for 1100 a month. So we're using public funds to build housing in West Louisville that is renting and costing exactly what they're building in the, in the private market. Is anyone familiar with the Germantown mill lofts? So that's, that was built in the private market, right? No public funding for that. And we think of that as kind of like, I don't know if it's luxury apartments, but it's nice, right? It's nice. Those apartments are renting for $1,100 a month. So this is exactly what we're using public money to build, and, we're, and it's affordable housing trust fund money, and I think a lot of people think that affordable housing trust fund money should go to low-income people. Is that pretty much what everyone, that was what I thought too. But when you dig into it, that's not what it's being used for at all. In the Russell neighborhood, we gave developers a million dollars in 2015. The city gave them a million dollar forgivable loan to do market rate housing in Russell in the Cedar Street area. Those houses today, at the end of 2018, are selling for over 175, right? So that housing was supposed to be between about 80 and 150. It's already coming in at over 175. And when that happens, it keeps increasing and it keeps going up. Think about Shelby Park today. Think about what happened in Smoketown and Shelby Park. In Shelby Park, you've got, you know, you've got 1,400 square foot houses selling for 250,000. People can't afford that. People are being priced out. So what I'm concerned about is how hard this is going to hit the West End. Since the, since the West End is segregated the way it is, I just don't know where people are going to go once this starts to hit. And if you look at Nashville as an example, the mayor of Nashville just made, Nash, the city of Nashville just allocated $500 million in affordable housing, and they're asking the private sector to put $250 million into that, and they're doing it at the lowest income level. So they're making sure that all that money goes to people making under 25 k a year. And instead of giving the private sector money, they're asking the private sector to help out. They're not doing that because they suddenly want to be a compassionate city. They did that because they gentrified too quickly. And what happened was homeless families started showing up at the shelters in mass, right? And they didn't have substance abuse issues and they didn't have mental health issues. These were just families that could no longer afford rent in Nashville because they decided to gear their whole economy to letting the finance sector become more wealthy and make money off this process. And now they're dealing with the fallout. My point to the city of Louisville is we're not there yet. There's still time to turn that tide. We don't want to be where Nashville is five years from now. But we're following a path that Nashville followed. And in Louisville, I think it's a little bit worse. So one of the problems in thinking about this is we just tend to think that investment is good and everybody benefits from it, right? One of my favorite authors is Mercer Baradaran, and she wrote an op-ed recently in the New York Times about opportunity zones and said something that, that's very true. She said the benefits of capitalism always accrue to the owners of capital, right? So if you don't have capital, you can't gain from capital. It's like monopoly. It's like you can't, you can't get in the game. You're always going to be the victim of capital if you don't, if you don't have something to, to put on the table. So what we have today is with, when Buchanan Worley was abolished, racial zoning didn't go anywhere, right? It just became de facto racial zoning. So the way wealth has been created through real estate throughout you know, the last 100 years is cities are sprawling, right? And that land on the outside of cities is zoned agricultural. So if I'm a developer, I buy some land that's zoned agricultural, and if it's zoned agricultural, it's worth less money, right? So say I buy 30 acres of land, zoned agricultural, and, and, and it costs uh, $80,000. I take it to the planning commission, I get it rezoned residential, now it's worth three million, and that's wealth. Bam, just like that. The same thing is happening through gentrification because the land is worth less because black people live on it, and that's the only reason it's worth less. So when a white developer gets it, it automatically is worth more money, and then he resells it, and he made wealth for himself. That's how Donald Trump got rich, right? So black people have sort of been used to this placeholder to depress property values. And has, it, has that transfer occurs through gentrification, through this sort of incentivization of whiteness, wealth is being created. And this is really our new economy, and it's, all over, it's, it's happening all over the country. This is, how we, this is how wealth is being made today. And it's very artificial, right? It's just sort of a rigged system. So we have to think of solutions collectively.
throughout our history, oppression occurs collectively. People are not oppressed as individuals, right? They're oppressed as a group of people. Think about slavery or police terrorism or redlining. It's oppressed as a group, but then the solutions, the policy solutions always come to individuals. Home ownership, right? Section 8 voucher, a financial literacy class. We always design policies for individuals. So our solutions have to be collective in nature. And we have to kind of think of real estate the way the workers at Ford thought about Ford Motor Company. They knew Ford was not designed for them to benefit from, right? They knew it was designed for their exploitation. So through collective bargaining, they gained power that first protected themselves from that system before they were able to extract benefits from it. Most of this work on redlining for me, and I'm real clear about it, I really, in doing this work, was really trying to bring forth more evidence to make the case for reparations. Like, you can't really look at redlining, you can't really look at our history, you can't really look at the, the data around wealth and gentrification without a real conversation about a debt being owed to, owed to the people in this system. And uh, I'm real clear about that, and people, people are like, well, it shouldn't be a check. Yes, it should be a check. Right? We need to calculate the value of wealth that's been stolen from black people in this country, and we need to write checks to people. And if that needs to come through like a, a greater restructuring of society, I'm all for it. But we need to acknowledge that a, check, a debt is owed through this process. Uh, and we need to understand that like, investment is not a tide that lifts all ships. Right? And, and, and we really have to contextualize that relationship between racism and real estate, and we need real policy change. So we need community land trust, right? A community land trust protects people from, from the investment that comes. We need rent control. We need a national conversation about rent control. Rent control can't just happen in LA and New York. It needs to happen elsewhere. We need tenants unions, we need philanthropy, we need collective ownership models, and we need invest divest. I'm gonna get through a couple of slides because I really wanna hone in on why this happened. And I think it's important to understand like, why redlining occurred and the intentionality behind it, right? So uh, there's a book called The Peculiar, Peculiar Institution by a guy named Kenneth Stamp. He wrote it in the 30s, and he wrote it about slavery, right? He kind of wrote about the history of, of slavery in the South. In that book, he talks about, he says, the Negro and the white servants of the 17th century seemed to be remarkably unconcerned about their physical differences. He said they worked together in the fields, they had kids together, they got married, uh, and he said the, the, the first like southern ruling class was quite familiar with rigid class lines, but they were not familiar with chattel slavery. So he said by the 18th century, color had become not only the evidence of slavery, but also a badge of degradation. Thus the master class, for its own purposes, wrote chattel slavery, the caste system, and colored prejudice into American custom and law. And what he's talking about there is in the early colonies in the 1600s, when, when African slaves were first captured, they were brought here and they worked alongside white indentured servants. So these were like the lowest caste people in Europe, the white people, and they were working together. And there was no concept of whiteness at that time. Complexion wasn't really seen as a thing. The word white doesn't even appear in any book until 1671. So a French person doesn't see an English person as a white person, right? Europeans have been killing each other for centuries based on religious designation, based on nation boundaries. Like, complexion didn't really exist. So what you had in those early colonies with those white indentured servants and, 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 the, and the, the Afri African slaves that were captured is they got along really well. And they were revolting together, right? And they lived together. They didn't see, they saw a connection based on their own positionality in this economy. So in 1671, a group of people burned Jamestown to the ground. And the colonial powers sort of saw a problem here. Like these two groups of people working together would be devastating for the small group of people in power, right? And what they did is they introduced this notion of whiteness into that system, right? And they said, you are white and we are white. So you are with us and we're gonna give you some things. We're gonna give you like a gun. We're gonna give you some land. We might give you like a bushel of corn, right? And you're a lot better than they are who don't have any of that stuff. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called that a, a mental wage, right? A feeling of superiority. They didn't give them very much. They gave them just enough for them to feel superior, right? And they made it almost punishable by death to intermarry. And a lot of those revolts stopped. And, the, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and they stopped running away and they stopped working together. And was, we get this, you know, so there you have like the creation of racism that was designed for economic purposes, right? And the creation of like a, a, a complexion-based narrative. And what it did is it kind of tricked the white people into identifying with their oppressor and thinking they, had, they shared some sort of common, commonality based on skin color. 
my thesis, and this is sort of what I concluded in my book, is that a similar thing happened in the 20th century. In the 20th century, you had people moving to cities. So, you know, black people were fleeing the South in mass, living in cities. At the same time, European immigrants were leaving Europe and they were living in the same proximity, right? They were living in densely populated urban areas. And what they were doing is they were forming trade unions together, right? And they were forming uh, uh, labor organizations. And this was such a concern at the time that in 1917, the National Association of Real Estate Boards, a private entity, launched an Own Your Own Home campaign. And they said, if we can create a nation of homeowners, it will stop a lot of these strikes that are happening because People who own homes are in debt, and if you're in debt, you don't go on strike, right? And that was eventually taken over by the U.S. Department of Labor. Clinton Stoddard Burr was a popular journalist at the time. He wrote about those European immigrants. He said they are from countries impregnated with radicalism. He said they belong, for the most part, to the lower strata of humanity. So in 1917, a person from Eastern Europe was not considered white, right? Italian people were not considered white. Irish people became white at some point in this, in, when this happened, but they weren't considered white. They were the bottom caste in their country. They were not considered to be white people. Woodrow Wilson was so concerned with black people joining the labor movement that he did not want them to go, go to World War I because he was afraid that they would learn about socialism and about communism and bring those same principles back to the United States. And he talked about that very openly. So we don't really do a good job of really contextualizing in our educational curriculums how important the labor movement was at this time and how big it was. So in 1919, four million workers went on strike in this country. That's like one out of every five workers walking off the jobs, right? So what happened was the suburbs were created. This was created to assimilate that group of European immigrants into whiteness, right? So that, that Italian person or that Eastern European person in 1917 who's living in a densely populated urban area organizing with his black neighbors on, doing labor organizing by 1955 is a white person living in the suburbs celebrating the 4th of July with a house and a lawnmower and a picket fence and all that. So there was an assimilation that took place and it was a similar sort of caste system has, has, has was created in the agrarian south. So in that sense, racism was really created to justify capitalism, right? Capitalism has to have high unemployment and it has to have low wages to exist. And we use racism to explain that. So we don't really question the notion that we live in a city where a median income in Indian Hills is 150K and the median income in Russell is 9,000. We don't question that systemically. I mean, like in the media or in po our popular consciousness, we don't question that systemically. We blame the people who live there for their own conditions. And in that sense, racism is sort of this serviceable product, right? So, so I want to end with this. I want to end with this James Baldwin quote. History is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. If we pretend otherwise, we are literally criminals. So what I want to just leave everybody with is that, like, I, I don't want to really get into like, okay, this is what we do as if there's one thing we can do. But I think in thinking about this, we have to think about power dynamics, right? And we have to think about how, how power happens. I've been going around the South for like the last six months and I sort of realized this a long time ago, but I hadn't really talked about it because I'm, t and, and for the last 20 years, I've talked to sort of radical organizers, right? But in doing this work, it's opened me up to a lot of, I find myself in front of a lot of churches and a lot of pastors, and I'm realizing the radical organizers aren't really talking to the pastors in the churches. And it's different in the rest of the country, but I think in the South, that that really needs to be a bridge that is made. Because that's where there's a lot of potential there to really do organizing work at a grassroots level. And, and I've just kind of, I was just in Birmingham a couple weeks ago and I just kind of, I've kind of reached this conclusion uh, and I've been talking about it, particularly with younger pastors who tend to be a little more radical and, and see the devastation that's happening over the next 20 years. So I think this housing issue and the intri issue of gentrification is every bit as important as climate change. And I think it needs to be a part of the national presidential debate. And I think there really needs to be a sense of urgency around it, right? Because I think it's gonna be utterly devastating in the next 20 years if we don't do something about it. So my grandfather always said, the best time to plant a tree is either 20 years ago or today. So what, whatever it is we decide to do, let's do it with, with a sense of urgency that's proportionate to what's happening. So I want to thank you guys for having me out. And Listen, let's really appreciate Mr. Josh Poe. <laughs>
I, I was I was thinking as he was as he was presenting, we have to protect this man at all costs. Lord have mercy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that and then, yeah, so Lord, uh, we're going to have question and answers, but I do want to say this. I am asking that whatever questions that you have, please make sure that they are um, applicable to what he has presented. So if you come to noon Bible study, you know that's my rule. Uh, if you're going to ask a question, make sure it's on point and on target. If it's about something else, we have pastors that will counsel you uh, in another room. So if you have questions, you can come down to one of the microphones here. And we want to, this man is a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we've got a few minutes. We're going to take a few, uh, but we want you to be able to take that opportunity. Testing. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Pope, thank you so much for coming. Question. Uh, while you were talking, you made a point about, you know, uh, all white spaces and all black spaces and something just came to my mind. I'm curious if there was a relation be relationship between the whole redlining situation and uh, the busing of individuals to schools. If there is a relationship, could you quickly say exactly how that relationship exists? Yeah, and that's the thing about redlining. It created so many. It's like redlining is sort of like what I call a root cause. And then when you have a root cause, it's sort of, I think of it as like a tree. And then the root cause, you know, there's, there are all sorts of leaves and outcomes that spring up from that. And busing was one of them. So if we think about the school situation, school funding was connected to property values, right? So there again, you have that relationship where automatically black schools are going to be underfunded. Busing is sort of, you know, it was a federal mandate that schools be integrated, right? So since Louisville had a sort of hyper-segregated city, they weren't able to integrate their schools without busing because we're residentially segregated. So busing is really the price white Louisville paid for living in homogenized neighborhoods. And that's, and th yeah, so it's directly connected to that. Hello, Mr. Pope. Your presentation was amazing. Thank you. Um, my question is, there are really two areas of Louisville that are homogenistically black. Mm -hmm. There's the West End, there's Newburgh. Newburgh, yeah. How does what you were talking about in your presentation affect Newburgh? I'm not really familiar with Newburgh, but to my knowledge, there's only one housing, public housing place out there, Barrytown. Somebody help me this from Newburgh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How would that affect that area? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't studied Newburgh, and you know, Newburgh kind of gets ignored in a lot of areas, even public policy and just looking at the city. Uh, I'm not that familiar with it. I don't know the housing situation in Newburgh, I don't, but, it, but it seems like, so when gentrification starts to happen, the, the, uh, the, the other poor neighborhoods or the other black neighborhoods become inundated with people, you know, moving in the area, and then they become overcrowded, and, and you just end up with a housing shortage all over the city. So. Since we're not building any new units, there's a lack of availability in Newburgh, but I could see it becoming more expensive to live in Newburgh as a natural outcome of this 10 years out. So, you know, I'd say, I'd say average rent in Newburgh is maybe 600 right now, 6, 700. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 900. And, you know, and, and then by 2030, if, we, if it starts to go up to 1100. And that's what we're seeing in other cities that have gone through this. Thank you. Uh, how would you go about uh, reparation. Well, I'm not the expert on it. Um, the, the the person who is the expert on it is Dr. Sandy Darity down at Duke. Uh, he's written out, and I don't and I don't talk about how to do it a lot because I don't think white people should talk about how to do it. It's like if I own if I owe Capital One money, they don't come to me and ask me like how do we how how do you go about doing this? I just have to pay them back, right? So I think that's the important piece. But Dr. Sandy Darity. Um, has written about that extensively, and then we have H.R. 40, which is a congressional order right now to study reparations. And I think that's what, that's what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get a lot of white people who say they're concerned about these issues to just support H.R. 40. And I, so I don't think we have like one solution, but I mean, what Dr. Darity says is that, you know, you calculate the value of the things that were guaranteed. So you calculate the value of land that was supposed to be giving to people in, during emancipation that really were supposed to make people whole citizens. So that was a part of gaining citizenship. Calculate the value of that. Calculate the value of wealth lost through redlining. Calculate the value of these things and then, you know, write checks. <laughs>
couple of quick questions. Uh, enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, first of all, individually, what are some of the positions politically that we need to be looking at to voting for that would help us in this situation? And also collectively, what should we do as a body so that this message doesn't get lost so that it gets uh, propagated throughout the city? Well, I think, I think we need a lot more. I think we need to develop more forums in the city to have these conversations outside of the forums sort of created for people by the city and by even nonprofits that are in service to the city. And Louisville is a place that really is sort of dying for new organizations and new paradigm shifts because we've had a lot of people just sort of in the same place for a long time. Uh, and, and, you know, they sort of have to be pushed out of those spots. So I think we need to, to have the organizing build the power and then run run people for city council but not just run people for political positions but make sure people get on boards and committees within the city right if you look at the boards and committees like if you look at the board of the affordable housing trust fund mostly developers are on there right so there are developers deciding about how we're allocating money to developers if you look at the boards of a lot of nonprofits like a lot of the boards are made up of, of the same people who are benefiting from this system so I think there needs to be a certain amount of disruption that occurs. And I think people um, really need to be more aggressive about, I hate to say infiltrating, but just getting on these boards and in these organizations where these conversations are taking place. Again, let's celebrate Mr. Josh Poe and what he has presented. Thank you. And I think, again, he said something that was so important is that churches, pastors, leaders, we have to have these conversations, we have to have these forums because these are policies, these are practices that are affecting us. And again, that's why I wanted him here. He's an amazing man. Will you tell them again where they can get their public, your publication? I have a story map. If you, if you just Google redlining Louisville story map or interactive map, it'll come up and I've got a website coming soon. I'll send you the website when that comes out. So. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to take a five minute quick break and then right after we're going to keep the ball rolling. Uh, we have Reverend Dr. Cassandra Gray. She is here and we're looking forward to jumping into mental health. So please make sure while you've got Mr. Josh Poe, make sure you ask him any other questions, but take you five minutes, get you a drink of water, use the bathroom and we're coming right back here. <laughs> 